VIP Access with Aniko on Africa Loud. Welcome back to VIP Access. An amazing show is awaiting you this week. I have a guest who I've wanted to have on this podcast for a very long time. And I'm certain she will come back when we have the Legends edition of VIP Access. Today, I'm hosting a Kenyan professional actor, voice of an artist, and musician. She comes from a very successful female music group called Tattoo. Um, you probably knew about Tattoo, and if you don't, you have to go to Google and look at this legendary um, female artist who really changed the game in Kenya. Welcome to the show, Angie Mwandanda. Some thank other people call you. you Shinde. Yes, they do, <laughs> depending on which era you know me from. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll respond to all of them. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Karibu, Angie. Thank you. Yeah, and before the interview started, uh, started I was actually asking... Um, the other one of your group members from Tattoo is Angela, Angela Dambuki. Dambuki uh, and then there's Debbie Asila. Debbie Asila, yeah. Did people always confuse the two Angies? Not only the two Angies, even Debbie. Really? Yes. It was, it's always so confusing because we're not from the same tribe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing that brought us together is music and performing. So everything else, I, I don't know why people think we look alike, even in the media, even in the newspapers, we'd always just send articles like, I think they meant you here. I think they meant you here. They must have confused you so All many times. Time. We're used to it even now. Even now. <laughs> it doesn't and some help people that. thought like you are sisters. Yeah, people still think we're sisters, but uh, I guess it goes to show the kind of bond we had in our time. That's dope. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. Wow, what a pleasure and an honor to sit here Thank with you. you for um, having me. You guys and you particularly have been such an inspiration. You know, growing up listening to Kenyan music, it was Tattoo and Issa and Nameless, that era. like that Ogopa DJ's era, and you are part of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, how was it? How was it? If you look back, uh, you know. When you look back retrospectively is when you realize how special it was. It was very special. But then special. at that time, I guess we were just following passion. Um, I was sharing with you earlier that uh, Angela and Debbie and I, we initially met at Phoenix Players, which was the repertory theater in Kenya, the only one actually in East Africa. And what that meant was they would stage a play every two weeks, a new play. So throughout the year, you would know uh, in February, a Shakespeare is going to be done. In March, they're going to do a Kenyan play. And then in December, they're going to do a musical. And so around the clock, there were always people auditioning to mm. be at that place. And uh, in 1999, I hope my age is not showing, <laughs> but that's when I went to the theater. And that's where I met Angie and Debbie. So we were very passionate about acting. And then uh, we also danced for Nameless for a while. Hello! <laughs> when he was an up-and-coming okay. artist, yeah. Angie and Debbie were more active when, in being when his dancers. When he was dancers. tall and skinny. Tall, skinny, and I think, <laughs> yeah, he was still trying to figure out his brand. At had least from had what he I've heard. taken up the durag? He had, he had, from the interviews I've heard, he had taken up this kind of... Uh, there's this Mexican guy who used to wear a cowboy hat and the, oh. the, the, like he wanted to remain incognito. Really? Yes. That was nameless back then. That was nameless back then. I think he had a song called Majitu. He had a, a mega rider as well. Of course. And so Debbie and Angie would be his stage dancers before Boomba Girls even came into play. So the way Angela tells the story is that at some point, Nameless was looking for a dancer who could be a bit more uh, seductive <laughs> or twerky. <laughs> <laughs> and so he dumped them and said, you know, thank you for your service. I but the Boomba girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he ch was changing his brand. And so when Angie was like, okay, Nameless doesn't want us to dance for him anymore. He's gone to Ogopa DJs to record music. And I think we also need to go to Ogopa DJs to record music. So that is the genesis of how we ended up at wow. Ogopa DJs. So everything sort of fell into place. Like what I'm sharing, we met at Phoenix. Uh, we became dancers for Nameless. Nameless said, uh, thank you, but I'm moving on to other things. And when she found out that he was going to record at Ogopa, we followed suit. And that's how we recorded our first song, which everyone now knows us for. Teso. 
Teso. Wow, <laughs> such a classic. Thank you. Thank you, you. You never know in the moment that you're writing down history, you know, when it comes to Kenyan music. like Not at all. And we were not even like on a mission to uh, make Kenyan music. Mm. We were passionate about performing because we were dancing and we were acting and we loved to sing. And so even when we found out that Ogopa is the household name that is making all these records, mm. we were just trying to be part of the record yeah. label. But we did not realize that at the time we were filling in a gap because there weren't many um, girl groups at the time, no. if at all any. I think the last two were, there was a group called Into, there was Zanaziki, there were Shades of Black. So they were there, but it was very touch and go. Mm. And so when we came, even the reception we were getting was overwhelming. We were not unfamiliar with being known because of our stage performance at Phoenix. We were, however, caught off guard because it was crazy. You'd get into a matatu, going to school, and people would start to recognize you. Um, at the time, FM stations were just coming into play, and they were playing our music off, off the record all the time. And so the popularity just showed us, okay, we're filling in a gap, and this is bigger than us. So what do we need to do? We need to produce more music. We need to show up for more gigs. And it just... Uh, spiraled from there. Wow. So, 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 how was it? Like, how how often do you did you guys used to perform, or it really depended on the seasons. So, what I do remember at the time, this is two thousand and three. Now, fast forward to two thousand and three, the popularity began to increase, um, and then by two thousand and four, I remember at least for a year. We were packed with gigs, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday, back Saturday, back, back, back to, to back. back. On some days, you have two gigs. On some days, you're in Nairobi, you perform, get in a, a van, drive all the way to Nakuru, come back. Wow. So it was a lifestyle that was, it was lots of fun. It was a lot of hard work as well, because I see groups moving with a stylist and uh, somebody to do the makeup and... We were doing everything for ourselves because we knew how to perform, but we didn't know the demand at the time. So we were working overtime to mm. ensure that we were giving our audiences everything. And it also got a little bit exhausting at some time, but we were still having fun as well. So would you say, um, you know, throughout the period, you all had like a sisterhood that kind of, you know, took you through the ups and downs of the industry? Absolutely. Uh I mean, Angie and, and Debbie will always be those people who were part of a very significant part of my youth. Um, we went through transitioning from campus now into employment and still finding time to work in between. Yeah. Uh, we transitioned into motherhood, at least for both Angie and Debbie, and mm. that's an entirely different phase of life altogether. So I would say that we, we did grow up together. There's growing up with, with people in the hood, but when you start to become conscious of your womanness, of your strength and your weaknesses, what makes you happy, mm. what are you passionate about, then I would say that, yes, we did form a sisterhood. Mm. We did. That's nice. That's really nice. And, and I'm happy to see you connect with the other Angie when you can. Like there was yeah. um, an event where we were together at the launch of Rai, yes. recording industry of Kenya. Angie yeah. was there. She was so happy, yeah. you know, dancing. <laughs> and she's also working um, in the music industry. What's yeah. her position? So Angie is the director of the... IFPI, let me make sure I get it right, the International Federation for the Phonographic Industry. Yeah. So she's the director for Sub-Saharan Africa. And her mandate is to ensure that national groups like Reiki um, and others in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa are set up mm. so that we can represent the recording industry in Kenya. Mm. Angie has always been extremely passionate, even when I knew her back then, about the music business. Mm. There's a performance which is fun, 
But she's always, even when I look back at something she had written when we were, I think, 19 or 20, she had said that she wants to be in the music business. Really? Yes. And uh, it's so it's so awesome to see her thrive in that That's area. That's dope. That yeah. is so dope. Um, now that we've mentioned, like, the recording industry of Kenya, yeah. you know, this is something that wasn't in Kenya, but no. thankfully now set up and you work as the, I don't know whether I should say work or volunteer, but you know, you've <laughs> given your life yes. <laughs> into Reich as the national coordinator of the country. Yeah. Um, and I know you work closely with a lot of other key stakeholders in the industry, including Mosioka mm-hmm. um, from Decimal Records. So um, maybe just explain to us and to me you know what Reich is and how um owners of their own music and producers can join Reich. sure okay so the recording industry of kenya or Reich, as we call it is a trade association that is set up to protect the interests of kenyan record producers or who we call owners of sound recordings, Mm. because not everyone who produces music owns it. Sometimes um, somebody will buy the music and they become the executive producer. So Mm. anyone who is the executive producer, whether you are a self-released artist or you own your record label, then you qualify to be a member of RIC. Mm. The reason why RIC is set up is because we're trying to put structures in place. Um, A lot of us who are in the music industry, even from my own experience, we only look at it from one side, Mm. and that is the performance side. That is the streaming side. That is the side where we make sure that our finished product gets enough airplay on radio stations. But because our country right now is slightly, I don't say immature, but young in the industry, There are structures that need to be in place so that everyone who invests in their music Mm. can bear fruit that will have the long longevity that we're looking for. So Reich wants to put those structures in place. If I was to explain to someone, because there's some legal jargon around it, which I don't want to get into, but I can summarize it into four. Our primary mandate is one, to issue out international standard recording codes. And in simple terms, it's an ID for your music. Mm. In mature industries, when your music has that ID, you're able to distinguish it from other music and you're able to get your royalties accurately Mm. based on that number. Right now, the way royalties are distributed, especially by the CMOs, which is collection management organizations, they sort of just give a blanket figure and that's what they have been able to do thus far. But what Reich is going to ensure is that the CMOs have structures in place so that we can issue out these codes to our members Mm. and they can accurately follow where their royalties are. And royalties are important. And to see where exactly they're coming from. Yes. And for which specific song or recording. And it's not only audio, it's also music videos. Fantastic. So you can get an ISRC code for your music videos Mm. and for your music as well. And it's across territories Mm. because that number is unique. So even if you were to find out, okay, did my song play in South Africa? Did it play in Denmark? Mm. Your code will help you identify. Okay. And so if if, if I'm an artist and I am distributing my song with a distribution company, Mm -hmm. maybe based in Kenya, Mm -hmm. do I um, still need to connect with Drake to get this um, unique um, ISRC ISRC code? code. Mm -hmm. Or should that company be in conversation with, with Reich? Because I know what happens like for, for a lot of artists, they just produce music, and yeah. then once it's ready, they're looking for a distributor. Because yeah. I always find artists asking me, who is the, the best to distribute, distribute my that. music? And I yeah. always say, before um, I say it is this company, I think you need to meet with them, you need to talk to them, you need to understand Correct. what it is that they can do for you, yeah. in what period, um, yeah. what are they offering, mm-hmm. what are the do's and don'ts, as opposed to just running to a company. So I was just wondering, for, for an artist listening, like how do I get this unique code? So your music probably already has a code, mm-hmm. but it's not unique to you. You might find that it's, for example, if you use our initials, 123AO, because you didn't get it from Reiki or Reich, and Reich is governed by IFPI, the International Federation of Phonographic Industry. Mm. They are the global 
stakeholders of uh, administering ISRC. Mm. So we're going through the right channels. It's almost like, um, to use an analogy, if you want to get an ID and somebody says, yeah, I can organize for you an ID to mm. enter such and such a club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But have you got it through the right channel? Yeah. And so the one that isn't gotten through the right channel might be more prone to somebody um, claiming your royalties on your behalf. So And that happens a lot in the industry. It does happen. Where artists get, get, get codes that are not entirely independent. They're not unique. And unique to them. And unique to and their And someone music. else might have access to. Exactly. And that more, is scary. It is scary. It's more scary that the awareness around ISRCs is minimal. Somebody like Musyoka, who you mentioned, because he's uh, forward thinking, he knows about ISRC. So you'll find that all his music has a unique code. He knew, he knew how to establish them. He knows how to identify where to get his royalties. And I do believe that he gets decent royalties for all his work. It can't be said for a majority of the record producers in Kenya. And it's simply because they just don't know. Mm. They're more concerned with, can I make a hit song? Will it play on the radio? And will I be able to perform and get some compensation for my work? And what we're trying to do is ensure... Aniko, I feel like it's a mindset change that we're trying to work with. Yes, structures are important, but it's the mindset that I personally feel as national coordinator. How do we change the mindset so that we're not only thinking short term? Yes. You know, yeah. we hear of so many uh, record producers and artists and creators who... Unfortunately, when they get to a senior age, they're not able to perform or produce music as well as they could. And then they don't have anything to fall back on. And then now we're getting to the nitty gritty of it. Let's start at the bare minimum. Let's give codes to people so that they can get accurate royalties. Mm. Let's start there. So ISRCs are just one of the things that we're doing. The second thing that we want to do is lobby the National Assembly on behalf of record producers. Mm. We recognize that we need government support in ensuring some of these structures are in place. Things like ratification, which I can't really get into because I'm not a legal legal. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are important things that we need to adjust to so that we're operating on global practice level. Of course. Um, the third thing that we want to do is enforce for anti-piracy. I was in a meeting with uh, one of the directors from IFPI yesterday, a virtual meeting, and the numbers they were sharing with us in terms of the piracy that takes place in Kenya alone is so alarming. If musicians knew how much money they're losing just for someone who chooses to download a legal uh, site or to go about piracy in a way that is bringing them money, but costing our industry so much. And uh, when I say our industry, I even say as as a whole, as Kenya as a whole, we lose so much money to piracy. And so we need to enforce things as Reich to ensure that um, blocking of websites that are illegal are put in place, working with the internet service providers is, like is Safaricom. Is anyone even cracking down all these places and, and websites? Is so, anyone actively doing that? You'd be surprised behind the scenes, uh, and that's why I credit IFPI, because they are in conversations with some of our, um, I don't want to mention them by name, by, but some of our important telcos okay. who have the power to actually take down okay. some of the websites. And the conversations have been ongoing for such a long time, years, I dare say. Um, but as usual, there's always somebody who stands to benefit from things that aren't done the correct yeah. way. Fortunately... That is why Reich is also here, to ensure that when uh, we can write letters to these telcos and say, these sites need to come down. There are over like 62,000, even in the millions of websites. Really? Yes. So you might find a tattoo song playing on a website, and I'm like, wait, I don't get compensation for that. Why is that even a site that is allowed to be on our, our, our platform? Why is it accessible to people? Mm. So somebody has to do... The dirty work. Yeah. I, well, I don't want to call it the dirty work, but the work of actually enforcing anti-piracy. Of course. To protect um, the rights of the record producers so that they actually get compensated correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third thing, which I know... The Monsieur, fourth thing. The fourth thing, sorry. Uh, I know Monsieur is super excited about this one, is music chart certification, which, uh, again, in layman, is really just about collating the data that we have 
so that we're able to quantify and say such and such an artist has gone platinum based on the number of downloads, based on the number of streams that are playing on audio, visual platforms, and also playing on audio platforms. If we're able to collate that data, then we're able to say um, Saudi Soul has gone platinum. Uh, Musioka Decimal Records has gone gold. Mm. And with that kind of information, we're able to have what they have in the Western uh, countries, the award ceremonies, the Grammys, because they're able to quantify and mm. say, okay, you're popular because you have such and such downloads, and for that we're giving you a platinum plaque for all the downloads that you've been able to achieve mm. in a, a specific duration of time. We don't have... Um, quantification of downloads and streams per se. When we're rewarding artists right now, we're rewarding them based on, I guess, popularity, which is fine, but we want to get down to the numbers so that when um, artists are uploading their music on different platforms like your Spotify and your Boomplay and your um, Apple Play and what have you, we're able to collate all that information, quantify it, and then give you um, your worth in terms of numbers. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible and and you, you just think about it like we've never had that and no. you know i see it in uh, many other industries like the uk um in america yeah. in south africa to certain extent absolutely um i've seen you know them issuing artists with plaques and stuff like that i was just wondering like why do you think it's very hard especially in east africa and kenya particularly to get any kind of start even from songs playing on radio stations or do you think it's the um, media institutions themselves hoarding the information but I, I would think that mm. in an industry some of this information can be a little bit accessible but not so accessible I think or would Drake be able to 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 know like this is um, how often this song plays across all the radio stations in the country, something yeah. like that. So would you be the ones to share with us those stats? Absolutely. I, I think it's just about structure. We've been operating in a way that is sort of, you know, people are doing one thing there and there's another, a, another one is there. Doing something there. So there's no body that's actually saying we're going to take up the responsibility of putting this kind of structure in place. So as Rike, we have had conversations with um, the Boomplays and the Spotify's nice. and the YouTubes already. Nice. And we're looking forward to having, with IFPI's guidance, because we do follow guidelines. We're of not course. just, I can't just go about it myself as, hey, I'm Shinde and I'm here to collect information. No. There are structures in place that have worked globally and we're going to implement them here mm. only because it has worked. Not to say that we can't do it on our own, but to some extent we want to take things that have already worked yeah. so that we can focus on how do we make things unique. You almost have to balance the two. Yeah. What makes us unique as a Kenyan recording industry and what has worked globally that we can implement here. Mm. So the conversations are ongoing. Hopefully... Um, by 2024, end of 2024, maybe 2025, we will have the kind of certification that we hope to achieve. Maybe have a Kenyan Grammy Award something <laughs> and small scale. And from there, it will just grow and grow and grow. And we'll have the structures in place that we need so that record producers can thrive. That's amazing. Did you guys meet with the Grammy team? No, when they were in... I think they were even in Nairobi, but the time they were here, I was yeah. not in the country, but I yeah. saw that they were having meetings with some artists. Um, I think they were having meetings with artists, but I think it was also a government-led conversation. Mm. And at the time, we hadn't launched yet. Okay, okay. So, but we are... Uh, Musioka, just to mention, so that people understand why I mentioned him so much, he is our chairman yes. of Reiki. So he is um, part of the team that is called Action Lab. And they are in very close proximity to the government who seem to be focused on the creative economy mm. this time around. So hopefully the next time that they're in town, Reich will have a seat in the room to be able to advocate for our members. That's dope. That's dope. Yeah. And um, so, 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 so for those listening, for the artists, for those who you know own record labels, own different recordings, how can they reach out to Reich? What's the immediate thing that they need to do? The first thing is to establish whether you own your music. How do you do that? It depends on the split sheet. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping that 
at least in this day and age, record producers are familiar with a split sheet. Mm. The document that says so-and-so is the author, that is the writer of the music, so-and-so is the record producer who produced the musical bed, mm. and so-and-so is the composer who brought everything together. The split sheet is like the bare minimum right now. Mm. You need to have that. And then I'm assuming that anyone who comes to us has already a full understanding of what it means to be an executive producer of the music. If you're an executive producer, you own the, the, the rights of your music, the final master, then you qualify to join us. Um, we do have different tiers. There are some who we are calling the founder circle. So they want to be a part of us at a very early stage and, of course, have a seat at the table when we're making decisions that are going to influence how the industry will move. But you can also still join for free. We're welcoming everybody who wants better for themselves mm. as music producers. So we do have an active website. We do our, have our contacts on social media as mm. well. If you look for the recording industry of Kenya, <coughs> you will find us. And I, I believe I'm reasonably accessible. So I'm happy to have conversations with anyone who is interested in joining us. Mm. Yeah. Wow, amazing. I love, <laughs> love, love what you're doing for the industry. And who better to do it than someone who's had an experience uh, of 20 years, you know, yeah. in the industry. <laughs> you've been in the music industry, you've been in the acting industry, yes. um, in the performance industry, and now you're still doing something for the industry. And I wanted to ask, you know, you started in acting and you still double in acting yeah. and many other things. So sure. you've been on Selena. Um, County 49 on yes, show max. Yes. Do, how, what's your relationship with acting? Uh, I usually call acting my first love. Really? Yes, not music. Not that I have anything against music, but like any other relationship, which as a human being, I'm sure you would know, when you make a connection and you just feel like this is home, that's how I feel with really? acting. With music, I feel like it's such a push and pull because sometimes it works in my favor. Sometimes I give so much to music and it doesn't give me the kind of return I wanted. But there's, Aniko, there's just something so special about being on stage or being on screen. It's almost like a very warm hug. And that's why I always call acting my first love. And that's why I always make time for it. If someone gives me a script or I hear of an audition, I'm always in the line, <laughs> ready to do it. Because I don't think I'm there yet. I feel like I've just begun. I feel like everything about my life, especially in this season, is only the beginning. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> so um, apart from these roles I've mentioned on Showmax, even County 49 is fairly new. Mm -hmm. Are there any upcoming roles that you, you are eyeing or are you having conversations with you know, directors or, or casting agents? Yeah, I'm always, I always try and stay connected to people. I feel like especially in the creative space, I never want to be operating in a silo. Mm. So I always am very intentional about the relationships I make, whether it's with casting directors, to let them know I'm available for a role should anything come up, whether it is directors and asking them, okay, I'm interested in one day doing a series of my own. Mm. Maybe you can mentor me. Maybe I can shadow you. Maybe I could learn a thing or two. Whether it's uh, sitting in a writer's room, I've done that before, just to write and find out what is it that it takes to put a storyline together. So I'm very passionate about putting any kind of production acting related together and I try and get involved as much as I can. That's dope. That's yeah. dope. Is there ever going to be, um, I don't know, like a tattoo reunion? I know Debbie, <laughs> Debbie is not in the country. She's no. been in America for quite almost, some time. Almost 10, it will be 10 years, I think next year. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's there with her daughter. Yeah. Do you guys ever have convos or a WhatsApp group where you are like, yo, we should do, uh, <laughs> you should like, uh, like reimagine tattoo yeah. songs or something. There's always, you know, I always tell people it's never off the table. It was always easier when we were younger and, you know, we were happy go lucky. We want to go to the studio. We just meet at the studio. But now, you know, with Debbie across the ocean and Angie is trying to change the music industry one legal eagle at a time. Yeah. Um, we, we say we will do it if the opportunity ever presents itself. 
it's just a different time now. It's just a different time. You know, group dynamics are quite tricky. Yeah. They're quite tricky. Yeah. Um, but I do, I am grateful that we're still able to call ourselves friends. That's amazing. Because yeah. a lot of people who used to be in groups together sometimes just like, can, can, sometimes we grow apart. It's not like, um, you know, like bad vibes or something, but you've managed to still keep it close knit. Well, as much as possible. I think it helps that even our families sort of know each other. Like I know Angie's brothers and sisters, she knows mine. I know Debbie's family. So it wasn't just a thing where we were coming together to make the music. Mm. We had a foundation that sort of helped us sustain. Mm. And even though we don't communicate as often as we would like, I know that's a place I can always go back to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it's amazing. never off the table. You never know. <laughs> that's amazing. Um so if you look back at your career with 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 tattoo um and the work you're doing now, you know, advocating for artists to know um their rights, to know their individual recordings, to have codes to them. Did yeah. you have that then or 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 and what are the, the repercussions of some of the recordings or the the decisions that were made in that era? Yeah. Uh for tattoo, I can only speak on behalf of tattoo. What worked in our advantage was that we had we always had a lawyer in our group, and that was Angie. So <clears throat> for any contract that was brought our way, she always had that eye to say, we're not going to sign this because it's not working in our mm. favor. We're not going to do X, Y, Z because it's not working in our favor. And even when artists at the time were signing contracts with Ogopa, you know, we never really, people don't know this, but we never really signed a contract with them. We were dubbed the Ogopalets. We wore their branding, and we were always very cordial in our relationship. But when it came down to the legal work, we never did reach the kind of agreement that would work in our favor. Um, whereas if maybe she wasn't there, we might have just signed it away and thought, oh, yeah, this is fun times, and not really have had an analysis to know, is this working for us beyond performance? Yeah. So having somebody with that legal uh, uh, knowledge always worked in our favor. Whatever contract we had, whether it was performing locally or even internationally, she was always there to make sure that things were working. Yeah, for because us. then in 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 that sense, with Agopa, it's actually better to not have signed than kind of sign your life away, especially when you are younger exactly. and you don't know the repercussions of what you're signing. Yeah. it's better to have this shared history and shared like an achievements out of goodwill and collaborations Absolutely. as opposed to just waking up one day and realizing, oh, we didn't realize what we signed away. Yeah, yeah. And then you get to a point where maybe times are hard and you're wondering, okay, so so so-and-so has like X percentage of what is mine. Mm -hmm. When did I sign this and why didn't I have somebody to sort of, uh, you know, guide me otherwise? But I, I would say that we are one of the fortunate ones. There are many people who I interact with, and that's not the case. Yeah. You know, they signed away their rights. They didn't know how to negotiate so that things always worked in their favor. Mm. So we were always lucky to have that f working for us. Yeah. yeah. So for someone like you who's been in the industry for a long time, in, in music, also in acting, what are the kind of repetitive issues that you find s still continue to haunt yeah. our industry? I think there are a lot of problems in every other industry, but then as industry continue to grow, um, some things get better, but certain things still continue to haunt us. So yeah. in, in your opinion, what are some of these maybe a few issues and yeah. how do you think we can still continue to work together to tackle them? Uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier on. Primarily, we can try and put as many structures in place as we want. If you don't have that mindset of not wanting to eat now, but try and preserve everything you're doing for the long haul, mm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether Reich or Risa in South Africa or whatever structures we're trying to put in place. Mm. You have to have the right mindset. As somebody who's both a musician and an actor, I happen to be in these online groups. So I can compare which one looks more progressive than the other. Mm. For my opinion, let me make sure I say it's my opinion. The actors in this country are hungrier for structure. 
they are hungrier mm. for things to work in their favor. It could be because of the um, the current happenings in the U.S. with uh, mm. the writers going on strike, and we're keenly watching to see what's working for them and how can we implement the same here. The conversations are hard and sometimes brutal, but if I'm to compare, I'm not saying that it's perfect. It's far from it. We have a long way to go. Mm. But because I have the, adva- the vantage point of seeing the musicians on the other yeah, side. Yeah, because you kind of see it on both. Yeah. You, you, sit on, you don't sit on the fence, <laughs> no. but you cross over from time to I time. I cross over. <laughs> so you can imagine a, a group of uh, actors in a WhatsApp group where we're really you know, trying to tear things apart so we can build them up again and talk about what worked and what didn't work. Whereas in the in the musicians group, in the record producers group, there's almost a mentality of, let me let me just get what's mine as quickly as I can mm. because I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm not saying those are the words. I sense that is the attitude. Mm. So we complain a lot about things. We complain about, uh, as musicians, oh, this event didn't charge, uh, didn't uh, offer to pay us the right amount of money, or oh, so-and-so is not a good promoter because the contract is this and that. You know, just repetitive conversation, minimal solution. Whereas here, we're having difficult conversation actors. But we're like, okay, I'm skeptical, but I'm hungry. Mm. And so I want to see what we can do. And there's a chance maybe structures will come in place in my lifetime or not. But there's a con- there's a more productive conversation mm. happening with the actors than musicians. Musicians, we have such a long way to go because we seem to think short term. Where's the gig? Can I have a full calendar in December? <laughs> and then, you know, you... you and I guess it also doesn't help that uh, structures like our CMOs haven't proved to be... Um, worthy in, of, of collecting royalties for our musicians. So there are many things that uh, we need to do as artists, as record producers on one end. But I would wish the conversation would be more optimistic. Not because I'm one of those negative positivity. You know that I hear people, <laughs> the buzzwords that seem to be happening online is, uh, what did I hear recently? Is it Ne- not negative positivity, but toxic positivity, mm. where you ignore all the bad happenings because you're like, no, I'm only good vibes only, good vibes this, good energy, good that. No, that that's not what I'm trying to advocate for. What I'm trying to advocate for on both sides, actors and musicians, let's look at where we are and let's come up with solutions. Let's vent for as long as we can. And when you're done venting, what do we do next? Like, yeah. what's next? And to just summarize what I was saying, actors seem to be more hungry for that solution-driven um, agenda. Whereas musicians, I feel like we've been beaten down so much. There's so much negativity. There's so much discouragement that it's almost everyone is operating in silos in the hope that a godfather will come and rescue them. So even as Reich, I feel the weight of, if it's the last thing I do, I really want to make sure that we tried and we were successful in putting structures in place so that record producers, artists, and what have you, they don't have this defeatist mentality. Mm. That's, that's what's actually driving my agenda when I, when I think about every morning, what am I going to do for Reich today? Do I send a letter to so-and-so? Do I have a meeting with somebody in government so that I tell them what about Reich? Uh, how do I get in touch with somebody like Nameless who has such a huge legacy and such influence? Can he come on board and mm. help us have these difficult conversations? So if I'm to compare the two, that's where we are. And I think as myself, I have a foot in both of them. And I'm looking forward to really influencing both sides in a positive way. You are already. (laughs) And um, I love your approach. You know, it's just like we need to create solutions. And here is one solution that, you know, can benefit a whole industry and individual producers, individual artists. Um, I think for me, that's the biggest takeaway, um, having also been in the industry for a couple of years. Sure. There's always so much talk. And in the past, I was also engaging in the talks. And sometimes it just wouldn't, 
go well. It yeah. won't go down well. <laughs> it's it's just like there's some negativity that you can't counter, you right? Can't so counter, I decided yeah. at some point I have to counter this narrative by the show of my work. Yeah. I would like to see more Kenyans supporting more Kenyans, more media people supporting more artists. Correct. But then I have to be the one doing that. You know, yeah. I have to do it in my own spaces and platform, and then that is how I contribute. Absolutely. I can't just come and write on social media, you all need to do this, mm. but I can do this every day. And exactly. if you look at me, you'll be like, okay, she's doing that. That's I can also do that. Yeah. So... Yeah, power to you, Angie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's not an easy feat, but I'm happy for the challenge, and I'm happy to be contributing to an industry that helps me become who I am. So truly, this is my way of giving back. Um, everything that I have, whether it's my energy, my voice, whatever skill set, if I go and go for a training, I'm like, okay, how can I apply it to my acting? How can I apply it to Rike? Mm. This conversation that I had with so-and-so, how can I apply it to the conversation I'm having with you right now? Mm. How do I, you know, talk about it in other spaces? Yeah. So everything adds up to the bigger picture. Definitely. Thank yeah. you so much, Angie. Thank you for having Anything me. Anything we haven't said that you want to say, any message you want to send to anybody, this is the time. Well, I, I, I think, thank you so much for all the work that you do. I think you should also get your flowers. I mean, from KBC and everything <laughs> that you've done up to now, I think I'm a big advocate for giving people their flowers. Thank so thank you, you Aniko. I hope you also wake up in the morning and recognize the role you're playing in the creative industry. Um, but secondly, I want to encourage record producers to come to Rike and have the conversation. Just come and understand. You know, we're not a collection management body. That's one thing I feel like I want people to take away because they mm. feel like, oh, the last thing we need is someone else to collect our money that we will never receive. No. Come to Rike understand how important it is that what we're doing and how it benefits you. And um, let's have a better mindset to building the industry. Mm. Let's have a better industry. Let's leave a legacy that we can be proud of. I pray that everyone who is part of our industry gets to that mindset where they want better. Yeah. So, I guess that would be my parting Thank shot. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much. It's been such a pleasure, such an Thank honor. Thank you for having me. Um, well done Thank for the work you. that you're doing, for including me and my team um, in this, like le letting me know what Rike is about, uh, because I think it's important for us all to know and to be able to to meet other artists and spread this gospel. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very glad that through you and Musioka, I know what Rike is doing and um, that we'll continue to advise you know, the industry people to follow what Rike is doing. I can't wait to see Thank you. Um, the chats, the countdown. Me too. <laughs> I will be so proud. That day I'll be shedding tears and I'll be like, oh my uh, God, I can't believe yeah. we got this far. So a lot of exciting things happen. So exciting. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank and you for having everybody. me. Everybody. Um, listening and watching us. Thank you so much for your time. This was um, Angie Mwandanda. Some people call her Shinde <laughs> from Tattoo, but she's also a professional actor, voice of our artist, and a champion for artists at large. Please follow the work she's doing as a national coordinator of um, RIKE, the recording industry of Kenya. Check them out on social media. Check her out on social media. There's a website of RIKE. You can go there, ask any questions, and um, see if you can get some information to share with other people. It's been amazing to be with you here at VIP Access. Me and Angie Mwandanda are capping off today. See you next week with another amazing artist. Bye. VIP Access Season 4 is proudly supported by the Australian High Commission.